what's left is right Chasing stars and holding you I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Assalamu alaikum bismillahir rahmanir rahim welcome everybody main kya sabko awaaz aa rahi hai agar in mujhe agar aap ek message karke bata dein ki everyone can hear us okay good that's perfect hum chahte hain ki sabko agar awaaz aa rahi ho to hum apna session phir start kare that's perfect everyone is saying yes yes ji bismillahir rahmanir rahim in the name of allah the most beneficent the most compassionate my name is dr wajid but i am associate with the uh, department of marketing and academics of with australian concept in fertility medical center um, i welcome you on behalf of acimc the whole team um, aaj humne basically is webinar ka jo inagad kiya hai uh, that is basically regarding the guidelines for covid-19 pandemic and a very important topic that's related to the subfertility jo ki hamara sabse zyada important kaam hai that is amh anti malarial hormone to iske upar aaj hum log ek session humne rakha hai aur usme hum log apne consultant ke through aap tak bahut aam jo hai wo information jo hai wo deliver karenge to main thodi si aapko pehle iske bahale se batana chahunga ki what is actually amh australian concept ko ye uh, main samajhta hu ki ek bahut bada एक आई थिंक ये बहुत बड़ा मार्क है कि एम एच को लाने वाला ही ऑस्ट्रेलियन कॉन्सेप्ट है 
और यही वजह है कि जब हम इस टेस्ट को लेकर आ रहे हैं और इस पर बहुत काम किया जाता है लोगों को हम लोग हेल्प कर रहे हैं तो ये टॉपिक हमारी स्पीकर आज कवर करेंगी मैं आपको आज की थोड़ी सी प्रोग्राम की हाईलाइट्स बता देता हूँ वी विल स्टार्ट विदिटेशन ऑफ द होली कुरान आपको ट्रेनिंग कॉन्सेप्ट के हवाले से थोड़ा सा ब्रीफ समरी मैं दूंगा टॉपिक जिसका मैंने भी तस्करा किया है उस पर हम लोग बात करेंगे और लास्ट में हम आपके क्वेश्चन आंसर्स भी इस हवाले से चेक करेंगे तो आई स्टार्ट विद दी नेम ऑफ अल्लाह विद रेसिटेशन ऑफ कुरान अद्दा के नाम से शुरू जो निहायत मेहरबान हमेशा रहम फरमाने वाला है बेशक हमने आपको हर खैर फजीलत में बे इंतहा कसरत बख्शी है बस आप अपने रब के लिए नमाज पढ़ा करें और कुर्बानी दिया करें ये हदिया तशक्र है बेशक आपका दुश्मन ही बे नस्ल और बे नाम निशा होगा जी खातिन हजरात अपने इस टॉपिक से पहले मैं चाहूंगा कि थोड़ा सा आपको ऑस्ट्रेलियन कॉन्सेप्ट के कुछ ब्रीफ पॉइंट्स बता दूं ताकि वो लोग जो ऑस्ट्रेलियन कॉन्सेप्ट के हवाले से भी नहीं जानते ताकि वो भी अवेयर हो जाएं कि व्हाट एक्चुअली वी आर डूइंग तो बेसिकली हमारे जो की फैक्ट्स हैं ऑस्ट्रेलियन कॉन्सेप्ट के हम समझते हैं कि हम लोगों ने बहुत काम किया है उसका क्रेडिट हमारे सी और डॉक्टर सजाद साहब को जाता है नो डाउट इट्स बीन लाइक ट्वेंटी टू इन दी आई सर्विसेज एंड वी आर गोइंग माशा वी आर द पाकिस्तान the biggest largest ivf branch network in pakistan if we talk about we have marshal attend 11 branches overall we are responsible for the first fpt baby of pakistan it is frozen embryo transfer uh, we have world class ivf lab delivering consistently a high success rate alhamdulillah we have uh, complete ivf treatment under one roof uh, independently quality assured by australian scientists on a regular basis we support non affording patients to our trust which name as angel trust and very important thing is you we train the highest uh, number of gynecologists in ivf techniques and technologies in pakistan to main samajhta hu ki ye itni achievement australian concept ne jo hasil ki hain that is require actually bahut hi consistent work kiya gaya hai iske piche um ab hum apne topic ki taraf chalte hain without delaying time aur main chahunga ki main aapko introduction do aaj ke hamare speaker ke uh, she has been one of the best name i think hum gaini ki baat karte hain sab fertility ki baat karte hain to usme ek bahut acha naam hai is waqt saath mein sir maujood bhi hain to bhi thoda aap se mukhatib hongi inka introduction lena chahunga professor colonel retired dr nazli hamid sahib Ma'am has uh, done uh, her MBBS and started her professional career in army by joining Army Medical College in 1985. She completed her FCPS in Gynae and Ops uh, in 1995. She did her MRCOG in 2000 and FRCOG in 2012 from London. In 1999, she went to National University Hospital, Singapore, on training in subspecialty, which is urogynecology. और मैं समझता हूँ कि मैम यूरो गायनी में बहुत काम कर रही हैं जो कि अनफॉर्चुनेटली पाकिस्तान में इतना अभी जो है वो बूस्टअप नहीं कर सका तो दैट्स थिंग दैट्स अ ग्रेट आई थिंक सब स्पेशलिटी ऑफ हर एंडोस्कोपी में शी इज डूइंग हैट एंड शी हैज अ ब्रॉड रिसर्च इंटरेस्ट एंड हैज बीन पब्लिशिंग रिसर्च इन दी नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल जर्नल्स एट प्रेजेंट शी इज वर्किंग एज कंसल्टेंट गायनाकोलॉजिस्ट एंड infertility specialty at australian concept infertility medical center and her special interests are infertility which i have mentioned before pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome i think this is going to be the very wonderful topic jo ke aane wale dino mein bhi cover karenge and endometriosis and fibrosis etc to main without any time ab apne speaker ki taraf move karna chahunga taaki apni presentation ko ab tak lekar jaye aur aapko is hawale se educate kare Mm-hmm. 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Wajid for an over generous introduction. Um, uh, all praises be to Allah and all grace is for Allah. And anything which we are sharing here and we are uh, working for, you know, is, is through the knowledge which Allah has given us, granted us. So we'll be talking basically about the clinical utility of anti-malarian hormone. And the main uh, uh, focus will be after a brief introduction of the, on the role of AMH in the management of infertile patients, the main focus will be how we are going to modify the treatment strategies in the current uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. Um, so regarding anti-malarian hormone, uh, we are all aware that this is uh, a hormone which is secreted by granulosa cells of the ovary. And they, it is basically secreted uh, uh, by preantral and antral follicles. And there is a rapid reduction in AMH gene expression in follicles once they become greater than 8 millimeters in size. And that is considered to be a desired physiological response. And that desired physiological response in, from the larger follicles which are retrieved during ART are associated with a higher success rate. The main mode of action of anti-malarian hormone is to decrease further, further recruitment of primordial follicles after an, an initial cohort has been selected. And uh, it also inhibits FSH-dependent growth and selection of uh, FSH-dependent growth and secretion of estradiol. So in addition to Suppressing so further selection of preantral and small antral follicles, it inhibits the FSH dependent growth and thereby it exerts a moderating effect. So, uh, in this slide, you see various uh, markers AMH, antral follicle count, FSH, inhibin, two, inhibin B, and estradiol. And all of these markers have been used in one way or the other as, as a marker for assessment of ovarian reserve. Uh, we, we know that ovarian reserve is not uh, a static thing. It, it is a dynamic variable and it declines uh, with age and it varies for any individual age group. It is a continuous process which starts uh, from before birth, you know, within uh, the in, in utero life and then it carries on until the time of menopause. And this process is basically driven by depletion of the primordial follicle pool over, over our lifespans. And there is a considerable variation in ovarian reserve between women in their reproductive age group. And generally, the peak levels are uh, uh, seen in patients in their early 20s. The important uh, thing to remember here is that if you see this graph, you know, in women who are younger than 25 years of age, the, the rise or, you know, AMH level can be a, a, a gradual rise from birth and, and you know, at a, at a consistent rate, or it can show peaks and troughs in the beginning. So now this just means that we have to be careful when we are interpreting the levels of AMH in females who are younger than 25 years of age. Then after 25 years of age, generally uh, the, the decline in AMH level is at a fairly consistent rate and then it becomes uh, clinically undetectable after 50 years of age, which is the uh, age of menopause. So uh, when we've mentioned that there are other um, uh, markers as well, like we, we did mention that uh, FSH and even B, E2 and enteral follicle count. So why we are stressing on uh, selection of AMH as, as you know, the chief uh, uh, marker for ovarian reserve assessment. This is because it correlates with the number of primordial follicles, which is a direct serum marker uh, uh, of ovarian reserve. And it is superior to FSH, inhibin B, and estradiol because it shows less variability uh, and also less variability than seen in antral follicle count. And obviously, as compared uh, to antral follicle count, it demonstrates low inter and intracycle variation. And then uh, it is not cycle day specific. In other words, you, you can perform AMH on any day of the cycle. And automated AMH level demonstrates better precision than manual ELISA assays. And other reasons for choosing AMH is that it is the best blood assay for quantitative estimation on the one hand, which means that, you know, you have a quantitative idea of ovarian reserve assessment and we will shortly see how, what do we mean by quantitative estimation. And hence, you know, it helps us in managing ovarian stimulation. In addition to that, 
it also gives us an age independent association about qualitative aspects of ovarian function which include the quality of egg the time to conception and the live birth rate so this is the single best serum marker for ovarian response management giving an age independent association with live birth rate and time to conception so um, here you see that in this slide that anti malarian hormone when you see it under when to meyer column so anti malarian hormone can be measured on any time except you know that obviously if the woman is not pregnant enteral follicle count ideally we have to do it from day 2 to 4 estradiol again day 2 to 4 and fsh also again day 2 to 4 so this is one advantage of amh that it it can be done as a walk in test of the patient and here we see you know how it helps us in quantitative estimation in the green belt is generally uh, those patients younger group of patients here you see this uh, x axis we see uh, on x axis we see the women age in years and on the y axis we are seeing the amh levels so the patients who fall in the green zone they are above the 25th centile and they are generally younger fertile women and if their amh falls in this range we have an 80% chance of six or more eggs in a simulated ivf cycle on the other hand if the levels fall in this orange zone uh, which is between 25th and 10th centile for younger fertile women then there is a 50% chance of six or more eggs in ivf so chance reduces from 80% to 50% if the uh, amh falls from a 20 uh, above 25th centile to between 10th to 25th centile and if the amh levels fall in the red zone which is less than 10th centile then there is a 20% chance of six or more eggs in ivf so uh, it it helps you in counseling of the patients with pretty um, uh, more precision uh, uh, as compared to other markers and ovarian reserve measurement thus helps us in uh, predicting the management strategy for infertility pred predicting uh, uh, a, a response to control ovarian stimulation and then tailor the treatment for infertility because we take amh and age of the patient as a guide to decide the initial dose of the treatment and then we monitor it uh, during the cycle and thus it also enables us uh, a relatively accurate counseling of the patient as far as polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome is concerned amh is especially gaining importance because it is associated with a uh, this condition is associated with an elevated serum amh levels both with nih criteria and with rotterdam criteria and women who present for fertility evaluation who have got a higher cma serum amh levels they are more likely to be uh, for pcos patients serum amh also correlates well with the uh, with the physical appearance of polycystic ovaries on ultrasound and higher amh also predicts severe symptoms which are linked to the sub phenotypes of pcos so if amh is specially high uh, the more likely chances are that the pcos uh, which is found in this patient is probably a, a severe type of a sub phenotype of pcos and then the markedly elevated age specific amh may be adopted as a diagnostic criteria for pcos so such is the importance of amh in this condition that there are chances and there are rec uh, recommendations that possibly may be included in the eventual diagnostic criteria for polycystic ovarian syndrome so here you see that if the amh is high you, on x axis you see the ovarian reserve and on y axis you see the amh level so uh, amh levels if amh levels are high that means there is a high ovarian reserve and as amh levels fall that indicates that the uh, ovarian reserve is decreasing and there is an increased risk of persistent and uh, uh, treatable infertility and uh, these days uh, we know that uh, the uh, the clinical applications of amh have also expanded beyond uh, uh, just the fertility calculation they also uh, help us uh, in predicting the age of menopause in a patient Uh, in monitoring ovarian of ovarian damage you know after certain uh, conditions medically or surgically or irradiation it also identifies women who are at a high risk of undergoing into an earlier menopause or women who are at risk for going into premature ovarian failure so uh, so with this be brief introduction to amh uh, which was which is so uh, close to the heart of you know australian concept we now move on to the sub fertility management the modifications which we need to adopt during covid-19 pandemic and all those uh, things which i am um, 
mentioning in this slide, we have all uh, we have adapted it all from ASHRAE guidelines on recommending ART treatments. And ASHRAE guidelines are, are they acknowledge very much that the, the guidelines uh, can be varied according to the national and international uh, uh, circumstances of within each country according to according to the guidelines persisting there. But by and large, we are following uh, these guidelines uh, in their original form. So uh, the basic principle is that infertility obviously is a treatable disease uh, uh, where the cause is understood well. And once the risk of COVID-19 infection is decreasing, all ART treatments will be restarted for any clinical in indication in line with the local regulations. The main thing is that what are we going to do now with this time, you know, when the COVID-19 infection has is not showing a fall right now. It is, uh, um, it is, uh, you know, there is there is a stress and there is a need that we need to exercise more vigilance and myriad steps uh, should be taken for a safe practice. And they, that safe practice is important not only for better patient care but also for the care of our staff who are taking care of these patients. So the aim of these guidelines is uh, to uh, to uh, guide us through the strategies which will reduce the risk which we can uh, uh, which we are, which our patients can encounter and which our staff can encounter during the infertility treatment in this time period. And uh, basically, it focuses on six main pillars of good medical practice uh, in any ART clinic or laboratory, which are you know discussion, agreement, and consent like even before uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is at the heart of uh, ART treatment. So that remains the main pillar. You discuss the things, you agree with the patient on the line of management that you're going to adopt and you take an informed and guided consent. Then we need to take the staff and patient trials. You know, so that trial includes appropriate history taking, appropriate examination and where uh, indicated appropriate investigations to ensure that the patients who are being subjected to ART treatment and the staff who is handling them are reasonably uh, in a safer zone. So, uh, and then uh, how are these patients going to access our advice and how are they going to access various treatment options? How should we adapt the ART services to serve these patients in the best possible way without jeopardizing their safety? And how should we plan the treatment cycle? And what should be the code of conduct for staff and the patients? And as I said, that ASHRAE does recommend that these guidelines should be taken as general guidelines and they can be modified according to local and national legislations of each individual country. So when we are talking about discussion, agreement and consent to starting, to starting the treatment, what changes in this pandemic time is, you know, that we should not be taking high risk patients, for example, those who are diabetic, hypertensive, using immunosuppressant drugs, uh, for beginning their ART treatment in this time period, because you know combining uh, multiple comorbids will jeopardize the, the safety of our patients. Therefore, ASHRAE guides that those patients who have got high risk comorbid conditions, preferably their treatment should not be performed in this time period. Then all the patients should be offered a choice to proceed with or postpone their ART treatment based on the triage evaluation, which we are going to discuss shortly. And whatever the patient preference is, that should be clearly documented. Obviously, you can only guide the patient and you cannot impose your, your decision or your opinion uh, dogmatically on the patient. So whatever informed uh, decision patients have taken, that should be clearly documented. And patients must comprehensively uh, be informed and they should clearly understand the risk related to COVID-19 disease itself and acknowledge that there is an increased risk in case of infection during pregnancy. You know, if the cycles are successful, if in, in a case where they were COVID-19 positive, then even their pregnancy is going to be a high risk pregnancy. And the patients must also be informed on how to reduce the risk of infection in general. And, uh, and then obviously a consent, the consent should include that the patients will uh, adhere to this code of conduct, mutually agreed code of conduct. So when we said that the triage uh, of management, so we start with a questionnaire and that this questionnaire is present outside the, you know, at the reception of Australian concept. And every time even I visit, you know, as a, as a visiting consultant, every time I have to fill this form. 
So, uh, have you been sick in the last two weeks? Do you have fever over 37.5 degrees Celsius? Are you coughing at present? Do you have a sore throat? Have you lost your sense of smell or taste? Have you been in contact with somebody who has any of these symptoms? So, it's not just, you know, you yourself having these symptoms, but if you are in contact with somebody at your home or at your workplace who is, uh, who is exposed to, who, who is showing these symptoms, that should also be taken seriously. Then have you traveled to an area at high risk for COVID-19 nationally or internationally? And I think probably the highest risk at, at the moment is being quoted for Pakistan because uh, recently I was uh, I was going through the statistics that, that the, uh, the Americans have supported that 25% carrier rate is uh, found in the, in the patients who are traveling from Pakistan. So do you work in a hospital or a nursing home or healthcare facility? So these are the questions. And in addition, have you been in contact with somebody who has diagnosed COVID-19? So previously we were talking about suggestive symptoms or suggestive possibilities, you know, if somebody has traveled, if somebody has been exposed to, but now we are talking about somebody who has been in contact with actually COVID-19 diagnosed positive patient or have you been diagnosed with COVID-19 yourself? Do you live in a household with somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID-19 infection? If you have been COVID-19 positive and recovered, do you have a certified medical evidence of clearance? So, uh, so this half of the questionnaire is relatively more specific and more intense. And do you have a severe medical condition like diabetes, respiratory disease, chronic liver, chronic kidney disease, etc.? As I said earlier, that combining multiple comorbids will uh, not be in the best interest of the patient. And uh, similarly for the staff, you know, we, we need to take the triage information from the staff as well. Uh, the health status, their own health status, the, any symptoms or lifestyles of the clinical team members and of the individuals who are living in their household at least two weeks before they started beginning a clinical work at one particular center. And staff who are suspected of infection after triage should undergo regular uh, COVID-19 screening with IgM or IgG testing. You know, this, this by this we mean that those patients who were at the initial, when, when they first came, they, were, they belonged to a low risk group. But then during the course of their stay here, uh, in between they, they were suspected of having, you know, some symptoms uh, or suggestive symptoms. So then again, that means that they have to undergo through that uh, reiterated cycle. An additional or more frequent testing can be considered in line with national recommendations and, avail and or availability of tests. So now availability of these tests in Pakistan is also increasing and so uh, uh, we can conveniently exercise uh, these guidelines you know, uh, for in the best interest of our patients. Uh, staff members who test positive for COVID to either IgM or IgG irrespective of presence or absence of symptoms, should receive health advice and go into self-quarantine, right? So these are the patients who are just immune positive, whether it is an IgM, which indicates an active, uh, uh, you know, recent immunity or IgG, relatively older immunity. So uh, that is, uh, at the moment, the guidelines say that these patients should follow a self-quarantine for two weeks. And then those patients who are symptomatic should be referred for medical advice and testing and should not reattend work until the infection is cleared and they have been documented by negative PCR test or an equivalent. So PCR it, it shows the infectivity of the patient. So when we allow them back to the workplace, they have to um, show the evidence of clearance of the disease by a negative PCR test. Then contact tracing and testing should be a routine if a staff, staff member is diagnosed with COVID-19 infection. Uh, that is obviously uh, uh, keeping the national interest in mind as well, not just an interest of the center, in uh, the ART center. And then depending on the size of the unit, staff should be subdivided in mini teams. This is very important and this we are following uh, here as, as well. Because uh, if we divide our staff in mini teams, then we will minimize their interaction amongst themselves as well. So they can follow rota on separate days. So this is a, a, a brief summary of what we have discussed so far. So how are we going to uh, uh, address our, the safety of our staff? You know, after subjecting them, the subjecting them to the triage questionnaire two weeks prior to the start of their clinical activities, if they are clearly asymptomatic, in other words, they are triage negative, 
they go in the green line and they start to work. Coming to the bottom, if they have specific symptoms or a previous COVID-19 test positive or triage positive, again, the, this is very clear that they go to occupational health advice and self-quarantine. So the uppermost green zone and the lowermost orange zone are very clear. So in between, the patients who are uh, belonging to mild or non-specific symptoms or where the triad suggests that they could be potentially positive, in those patients, they should be tested for at least antibodies tests, so IgM and IgG. And if they are negative for the antibodies, they go to the green zone. If they are, if they are positive to the, for those antibodies, they, they fall in the orange zone. And similarly for the patients, all patients planning to start treatment should have a triage questionnaire, either on paper, email, or phone two weeks before commencing treatment. So here it is important that we see that we have an option of email or phone, and we will uh, discuss shortly that uh, the guidelines uh, actually encourage uh, uh, telemedicine clinics for, those, for all those procedures which can be performed, which do not mandate that we should have a direct encounter with the patient. And filling the triage questionnaire belongs to one of those categories. So two weeks before commencing the treatment, we can get this triage questionnaire uh, filled on email, phone, a preliminary triage of both partners should be performed. So this is again important, not just the female partner, both the partners, husband and wife, before starting the ART treatment. And a further triage of both partners should again be performed during ovarian stimulation. So, so a, a triage questionnaire which was filled two weeks before commencing the treatment should not be taken as the gold standard or, or as the absolute thing. But once the ovarian stimulation is actually started, they can again undergo that questionnaire. And then this trial should be performed according to the same procedures which were used for staff members and for the partners should all those questions which we discussed for the um, for the staff. All those questions uh, the patients are also subject, subjected to the same question. Patients who are suspected of infection after triage should get regular IgM and IgG testing or equivalent test. I'm talking about suspicion here. So those who have got where uh, after the triage questionnaire, again, just like staff, you are just suspecting that these could be potentially positive patients, they should have an antibody testing. And additional testing can be considered if our national budget allows, you know, going for to a PCR test for those group of patients. But all patients with previously confirmed COVID-19 infection should present medical evidence of clearance in order to be eligible for treatment. And that medical evidence of clearance is in the form of PCR negative test. And if a patient has been on respiratory support during that particular COVID-19 infection episode, they should additionally provide evidence of assessment by a, a, a respiratory specialist or a medical pulmonologist or a medical specialist. So even for the patients, we have got three different scenarios. And I've in this slide, I've uh, uh, included scenario one and scenario three, not scenario two, because that is in the following slide, because scenario one and three uh, do not have any confusions. So scenario one uh, includes uh, those group of patients where both the partners, both the husband and wife have been triaged as low risk based on a negative clinical history, their lifestyle being compatible with low or minimum risk of contact with potentially infected individuals and both of them themselves being asymptomatic. So these are the group of patients who can straight away uh, go for the treatment. Scenario three, are those patients who are straight away to be excluded from the treatment and these are those group of patients where patient and or partner is either symptomatic or COVID-19 positive. We have to postpone the treatment and we have to refer them for further testing and follow-up. Scenario two is the intermediate category where we have to be open-minded depending on uh, the further investigation results of these patients. These are those patients who have recovered from a previous COVID-19 infection Proven by a certified medical evidence of clear, clearance, they should have a, a COVID-19 IgM, IgG testing prior to starting treatment, which confirms you know, their immune status. And if the, there is a presence of non-specific symptom in any of these partners, despite this, before starting ovarian stimulation, we can again repeat the trial. So reiterating over and over again, over and over again, wherever symptoms arise again, wherever the suspicion arise again, you have to, uh, again, uh, uh, subject them to the triage. Non-specific symptoms arising during ovarian stimulation just need uh, uh, an IgM and IgG testing. 
So this is uh, the summary of this. If the patients are negative for the triage, straight away continue the treatment. In those patients who, who, who have symptoms, we perform IG, uh, IgM or IgG antibody test to decide whether we are going to proceed or not. If they are negative for antibodies, we continue the treatment. And if they are positive for antibodies, we postpone the treatment and uh, refer for further testing before deciding whether we are going to proceed with the treatment or not. Again, this is a summary figure for the patient triage. Scenario one, where both the partners are asymptomatic and when subjected to triage were found to be negative, they go for the treatment. Scenario three, scenario one is clearly include. Scenario three is clearly exclude, where patient or partners with specific symptoms or a previous COVID-19 test are labeled as triage positive. They are excluded from the treatment. This intermediate scenario, scenario two, needs us to be open-minded based on the results of antibody tests for IgM and IgG. And in those patients where the symptoms are mild or non-specific and tests are negative, they go into scenario one and those where the tests are positive, they go into scenario three. So regarding access to advice and treatment, patient education on COVID-19 risk and prevention is an essential step prior to acceptance for treatment. And this education should include tutorials on the use of even personal protective equipment by the patients if required, advice on continuation of social distancing and avoidance of unnecessary human physical contact, reducing the number of attendants who are coming with them during consultations, information about symptoms of uh, COVID-19 infection for exposure occurrence, an agreement that the treatment can be discontinued if the patient encounters a high risk situation. This is important because, you know, if you discontinue, if you decide to discontinue the treatment without prior counseling, uh, the patients can react uh, very severely. So a guidance on adaptation of services at the center, in the center is summarized below. Uh, we follow routine sanitation of all the areas according to the local protocols, but if a specific COVID-19 positive patient is encountered, then specific COVID-19 sanitation procedures should be implemented, uh, whether they were COVID-19 positive patients or staff members. How we adapt ART services, the treatment of each patient should be completely rethought and individualized, even as we were doing in uh, uh, non-COVID time. In order to reduce unnecessary visits and staff patient contact, telemedicine should be used for all those steps of the treatment which do not require physical presence of the patient at the center. For example, counseling sessions. Staff and center adaptation should include COVID-19 specific training, COVID-19 specific standard operating procedures, adjusted work shifts. And then there should be an emergency agreement between different ART centers to guarantee continuity of treatment provision in case, you know, the treatment cannot be continued at one particular ART center. Access procedures, uh, limitation of the number of persons who are simultaneously present in the center. So that means that the appointments should be divided. Uh, provision of protective screens for administrative staff, which all the uh, our staff is having. Provision of personal protective equipment and sanitation devices for patients and staff. Restriction of access for partners and accompanying persons. You know, infertility, especially a situation where patient would like to bring, you know, mother-in-law, mother, husband, so we have to restrict the number of people who are accompanying the patient. Redesigning our waiting rooms, uh, if we cannot redesign them, at least, you know, uh, rearranging uh, the furniture so that uh, the working space is uh, enough to guarantee appropriate distancing of the patient. And obviously that is only possible if we manage the appointment according to the specific timetables and appointments not only for consultation, but also for scans and blood tests. And we subdivide the staff into mini teams to reduce unnecessary exposure of patients and staff members. And we follow up the patients three weeks after oocyte retrieval and or embryo transfer in order to identify potential COVID-19 positive patients and implement necessary treatment, which includes COVID uh, contact tracing and sanitation. So again, this is very important here. So the, 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 the screening does not just end with embryo transfer. Even when the patient 
follows up after embryo transfer, you know, when the result is positive, even then they have to undergo through the screening trials because even picking up at that stage, if, if they were exposed in that period of time, that has its implication in, uh, in terms of a, a pregnancy with COVID-19 positive uh, status. Uh, in the treatment cycle, ovarian stimulation is to be monitored. During this phase, following specific precautions should be taken. Minimal exposure for both staff and the patients. Isolation of the staff showing symptoms of infection. Use of personal protective equipment by all the staff. Minimum number of visits and optimized number of blood tests. Vaginal probes and tissue hygiene. Retriage and an action depending on pre-triage results or new non-specific symptoms. Regarding oocyte retrieval, in addition to the general precautions based on the trials results, following precautions are again made. Scenario 1, follow standard procedures unless changes occur between ovulation trigger and oocyte retrieval. So, if you have initially judged that the patient trials negative and after that, the patient has been negative from oocyte pickup, then the trials are negative from oocyte pickup. So, that patient remains in scenario 1. If the patient tests positive, I am going down now straight to scenario 3, skipping the scenario 2 in between. So if the patient tests positive for SARS or COVID-19 before ovulation trigger or embryo thawing, postpone treatment and refer and isolate the patient. So, if you have done it in the beginning and it was negative, but after that, when you have picked up and you have to transfer the embryo to the embryo, तो उस वक्त आप दोबारा उसको करते हैं और अगर उस वक्त तो है तब भी आप एम्ब्रियो फ्रीज कर लें और उसको नेक्स्ट साइकल तक ले जाएं। सो क्लियरली उस साइकल को आप एक्सक्लूड कर दें। दैट स्टेप इन दैट साइकल। सिनेरियो टू इन बिटवीन। इफ यहाँ पे फिर ये है कि इफ देर इस अ पॉजिटिव रीट्राइज so if they are negative on those tests, they go into scenario one, and if they are positive on those tests, they come down to scenario three. Those patients who are at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, uh, here we need to perform certain uh, exceptions. So in this case, oocyte retrieval could be performed, and unit sanitation should follow. Yani jahan pe aapko lagta hai ki agar aapne oocyte retrieval nahi kiya, aur patient ovarian hyperstimulation mein jayega, you should form a post-site retrieval and the unit sanitation should follow according to the specific COVID-19 sanitation procedure. If a potentially SARS uh, uh, COVID-2 or COVID-19 positive patient must continue treatment, then um, uh, and this includes those patients, for example, oncology patients or who are the patients who are at high risk of ovarian, ovarian hyperstimulation, the following measures should be adopted to reduce the risk. Uh, mask according to the clinical duty requirements, gowning, disinfectant of operation theater, transfer room, IVF lab after the procedure, and the procedure should be cancelled for newly diagnosed COVID-19 positive patients. So as far as lab care is concerned, routine good laboratory practice should be followed and lab staff should wear masks and gloves like they do always. They, the lab staff should also be organized in many teams. Extra care should be taken to reduce exposure to native follicular fluid and sperm by dilution and safe disposal of fluids in individual closed containers as quickly as possible. Published guidelines on good laboratory practice principles should be followed at all times. And should a patient become suspect or positive for COVID-19 during embryo culture, a freeze-all policy should be adopted. When embryo transfer is being performed, again limit the number of staff members present in the transfer room, restrict access for accompanying persons, perform the transfer only in cases of low risk or asymptomatic patients and partners, apply a freeze-all policy for all patients and or partners who become symptomatic after oocyte retrieval. So, other oocyte retrieval ke baad positive ho gaya, to freeze all kare, even if it was not planned beforehand. A cryo preservation in such cases should be performed in high security straws and vapor phase storage tanks, and they should be used for cryo preservation of samples for COVID 19 positive patients. So, again, summarizing so, after each uh, you know, uh, group of 
प्रोसीजर्स पहले हमने पेशेंट ट्रायल्स की बात की फिर हमने स्टाफ ट्रायल्स की बात की फिर हम अब जैसे ट्रीटमेंट की बात करें तो हम फिर उसको हर जगह पे आप ये देखें कि वी आर डिवाइडिंग आफ्टर ऑल दैट थिंग इनटू थ्री ग्रुप्स डिवाइडिंग द द एंटायर पॉपुलेशन इनटू थ्री ग्रुप्स सिनेरियो 1 सिनेरियो 3 एंड सिनेरियो 2 सिनेरियो 1 इज वेरी क्लियर वेयर यू हैव टू वेयर द पेशेंट इज ट्रायल्स नेगेटिव सो अब अब यहां पे हमने समरी की है कि उनमें अगर स्टिमुलेशन है तो भी स्टैंडर्ड प्रोसीजर आपने फॉलो करना है रिट्रीवल है तो भी आपने स्टैंडर्ड प्रोसीजर फॉलो करना है और ट्रांसफर है तो भी आपने स्टैंडर्ड प्रोसीजर भी फॉलो करना है दो पेशेंट्स हुआ सिनेरियो थ्री यानी नाइन कोविड नाइनटीन पॉजिटिव फॉर देम स्टिमुलेशन है तो भी पोस्टपोन है रिट्रीवल है तो भी पोस्टपोन है अनलेस दे आर एट हायर वेरियन हाइपर स्टिमुलेशन और ट्रांसफर है तो दैट ऑल्सो नीड्स टू बी पोस्टपोन फॉर सिनेरियो टू वेयर द पेशेंट्स आर सस्पेक्टेड uh to have symptoms they should be subjected to again antibody test igg and igm and if they are negative they go into scenario 1 category and if they are positive they go into scenario 2 category so वैसे अगर बात हम कर रहे हो तो स्लाइड में लगता है कि बहुत ज्यादा मटेरियल है लेकिन अगर आप ये सिर्फ ये तीन और ऑरेंज स्लाइड्स जिनको मात्र में एक दफा दोबारा देख भी सकते हैं अगर आप चाहें तो सिर्फ इन तीन स्लाइड्स को अगर आप अच्छे तरीके से देख लें तो बहुत आसान लगता है सब कुछ क्योंकि आपको लगता है कि दरिया कूजे में सिमट गया so code of conduct for the staff and patients all staff members and patients will be instructed to avoid unnecessary exposure both at work and in private to aapne unko mazid ye batana bhi hai it's not just ke ek dafa wo negative honge aapne unko batana hai ki ji in between bhi aap positive ho sakte hain so you have to carry on with that code of conduct that you will keep on avoiding that unnecessary exposure at in, in your workplace and in your private life each service will prepare compulsory instructions for the staff attendance at work will be tied to respecting the sign board of conduct activities which are not allowed will be clearly detailed for example expose your yourself less principle restrict social life and interactions patients should sign regularly that they are well and they have respected the code code of conduct staff members should sign regularly that they are well and they are respecting the code of conduct so this is an ongoing जैसे ऑडिट साइकिल होता है इसी तरह इसमें एक ऑन गोइंग मॉनिटरिंग है कि आप साथ साथ ये कर रहे हैं सो दिस इज लाइक हमने तीन कैटेगरीज को उनको समराइज भी किया हमने ये भी कहा कि वो कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट पेशेंट्स भी वेरीफाई करते रहेंगे कि ड्यूरिंग द प्रोसीजर दे आर फॉलोइंग स्टाफ भी वेरीफाई करता रहेगा दिस डिस्कलेमर इज बाय द एश्वरी एंड आई आई एम जस्ट रिप्रोड्यूस इट एज सच एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड आई welcome you all for any questions or comments please so uh, uh, there are quite a few things here in the chats so let me see uh, so i uh, in this chat i don't find any questions there are just few comments like you know drop your questions here उटेंट and like i said uh, antimalarian hormone is part of that ovarian reserve assessment and there are other tests as well which include enteral follicle count etc uh, so please bring your wife to one of the recognized art centers and uh, get an ovarian reserve assessment done next question is if amh is 0.4 and facing secondary infertility then how much chances of getting pregnant uh, i'll go back to the slide if you want but uh, we we did show that if the levels are 0.8 or less then they um, they indicate that there is 20% chance of having more more than six sex um in other words you know these are the patients who are not having a very good prognostic uh, future as far as um, c cycles are concerned and one is just to comment that amh stands for antimalarian hormone yes agreed uh, so another comment is it means that amh is more reliable than fsh for premature ovarian failure and infertility yes uh is there any chance of covid 19 transfer through semen 
Yes, because uh, it is the semen which we are uh, the male, from male uh, uh, partner. We are taking the semen and we are, uh, uh, you know, taking the um, the germ cells from the male partner from that semen, and that is why we are uh, subjecting both the partners to the triage. Uh, it's not sexually transmitted. I don't know whether it's a comment or a question. Uh, so please, whoever has written that this, I need clarification on this statement. What do you mean by this? Uh, how many slides in total? You can tell me better how many slides in total. Do you mail us? Yes, I can if uh, the organization has no objection because I, as I said, these are the guidelines from Ashri and Obviously, sharing is better so that all of us can implement. Uh, uh, there is a suggestion that I should mention the name of the participants who asked questions. I uh, purposefully skipped the names, you know, uh, for example, where a gentleman asked about his wife just to respect his privacy. Uh, if you do not mind, I can mention the name of the people as well. So. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nadia Zedi has requested, do you mail us? Uh, yes, Nadia, we can. Uh, uh, Dr. Sana Sheikh, can you please tell the role of my fall sachets in the treatment of PCOS? Uh, my fall, you uh, are talking uh, about uh, Yes, that is a completely separate topic and, and we can discuss if we were just talk, talking about PCOS. But uh, now, because we are talking about a different topic, I think we should better uh, restrict the questions related to this subject. Uh, next question, uh, comment is, can you send me these slides in my email? Okay, sure, we will. Uh, how much time this webinar session is going on and what time it will end? It's ending. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, follicle size 15.6. Uh, please can clarify what is this. It's a question or a comment or what? Interested person can take screenshot of slides. Yes, sure, why not? If we can share the presentation, why not screenshots? Is there any plan of you people to start? Um, yes, uh, there, there are a few administrative questions and Dr. Uh, Mr. Vajas will answer them. Dr. Vajas will answer them after this. Is there any plan of you people to start online certificate diploma in reproductive medicine to doctors? Uh, I leave this answer to uh, Mr. Steinberg. It was a wonderful and informative session. Thank you so much, Hanna Zahir, for your kind comment. Uh, please share your contact number. Okay, my contact number for patients is 0333 430 uh, Okay, um, what is the main connection between SARS and COVID-19 virus? Uh, they are uh, the two names of the same thing. You slash uh, So, uh, if unexplained infertility, is it necessary to, to perform any test before IVF? Obviously, you test it, then you will use unexplained infertility label. And you have to do IVF and you have to decide the dose bhi decide karni hai, monitoring and monitoring, so it will not be based on the test. Yes. On which day of cycle zygote is placed in uterus? Well, that depends on growth of the zygote. Uh, we do day 2, bhi transfer karte hai, day 3, bhi karte hai, day 5 transfer is considered the best. Blastocyst transfer. Laparoscopy before IVF is compulsory? Not really, uh, because, for example, if it is a total male factor infertility, I don't think laparoscopy will uh, change the course of event. Uh, okay, thank you so much. So, I uh, think time up. There are so many other questions which are coming up. So, agar, you can email address last slide mentioned web page web page presentation share in addition to Australian concept website available individually email request I leave that request to administration to be fulfilled. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Nazli. Very important things that you have discussed with us.
और इस हवाले से मैं समझता हूँ कि जो पी एम एच और जो कोविड नाइन्टीन की जो गाइडलाइंस हैं ये बड़ा इम्पॉर्टेंट था कि आज के जो सर्कमस्टांसिस हैं जो कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडेमिक की सिचुएशन है उसमें हम लोग जो कर रहे हैं तो मैं एक बार फिर शुक्रिया अदा करना चाहूँगा डॉक्टर नाजली का एक दो चीज़ें खातिन हजरात बिफोर एंडिंग ऑफ दिस सेशन मैं आपके साथ शेयर करना चाहूँगा सबसे पहले तो मैं बताना चाहूँगा कि जो ए एम एच है एंटी मलेरियन हारमोन एक्सक्यूज मैम ये टेस्ट हमारे पास अवेलेबल है कोई पेशेंट जिनको ए एम एच मतलब रिक्वायर्ड है करवाना है तो हमारे पास से फैसिलिटीज मौजूद हैं मैंने प्रेजेंटेशन के शुरू में भी डिस्कस किया था कि वी आर हाईली ऑबलाइज आई थिंक हम ही हैं वो स्ट्रेन कॉन्सेप्ट जो AMH को लाने वाले हैं पाकिस्तान में तो ये बहुत हेल्प कर रहा है साफ के बारे से दूसरी चीज़ ऐसे मैम ने बहुत ही ब्रीफ एशरे की गाइडलाइंस के मुताबिक और जो इंटरनेशनल हमारी जो गाइडलाइंस हैं कोविड 19 से रिलेटेड चूंकि सिचुएशन काफ़ी हालात भी कुछ इतने अच्छे नहीं रहे वायरस के हवाले से तो हम बहुत प्रिकॉशंस ले रहे हैं तो मैं आपको ये शोर करवाना चाहता हूँ कि हमारे यहाँ सेंटर में जितने पेशेंट्स आते हैं हमारा एक खास प्रोटोकॉल है जिसको हम लोग फॉलो कर रहे हैं फॉर द रेस्ट ऑफ द थ्री मंथ्स जब से ये वायरस जब पेंडेमिक हुआ है तो हम उन तमाम प्रोटोकॉल्स को लेके चल रहे हैं तो आप जब भी कोई पेशेंट यहाँ विजिट करता है तो एक प्रोटोकॉल के तहत हम उसको लेकर चल रहे होते हैं इसके हवाले से जो कुछ और जो पेशन आंसर्स हैं वो आप जो है वो पूछ सकते हैं वो लेटर हम आपको बताएंगे एक दो तो चीजें और भी मैं इसमें ऐड करना चाहूंगा कि जो आपके जितने अटेंडीज इसने भी अभी जो लोग शामिल हुए हैं उनके जो सर्टिफिकेट्स हैं वो हम आपको व्हाट्सएप या ईमेल कर देंगे इस दौरान कुछ पोल है और कुछ फीडबैक है इस हवाले से जो हम चाहेंगे कि आप लोग दें तो आप लोगों का बहुत शुक्रिया जिन लोगों ने पार्टिसिपेट किया अपना इतना कीमती वक्त निकाला और आपने आज की इतनी इम्पोर्टेंट जो इन्फॉर्मेशन है वो आपने सुनी मैं शुक्रिया अदा करना चाहूँगा अपनी कंसल्टेंट का प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर नाजली अहमद साहबा का यहाँ पे हमारे पास कंसल्टेंट जो पे मौजूद हैं और कंसल्टेंसी भी यहाँ पे दे रही है तो अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह मैं समझता हूँ कि जितने पार्टिसिपेंट ने अभी यहाँ पे मैं ज्वाइन किया है थैंक यू ऑल मैं आपको पर्सनल खुद भी कांटेक्ट कर लूंगा आपके सर्ट के हवाले से कोई क्वेश्चंस अगर आपके रह जाते हैं तो आप हमें ईमेल कर सकते हैं हमारा जो ईमेल इस वक्त जो पोस्टर आप लोगों को शेयर किया गया था हमारा यू नंबर है कोई क्यूरी ले सकते हैं इट जीरो थ्री आप उस पर कॉल कर सकते हैं वेबसाइट विजिट कर सकते हैं आप डब्ल्यू तमाम इन्फॉर्मेशन वहाँ पे मौजूद हैं बाकी जो इस हवाले से जो ए एम एच और कोविड नाइन्टीन की ये जो प्रेजेंटेशन है लॉट्स ऑफ पीपल हैव आस्क अबाउट दिस क्वेश्चन ऑफ नाजियाज आंसर ये रिकॉर्डेड आप हमें कांटेक्ट कर लें तो वी विल गिव यू द फीडबैक और इन फिर हम इस हवाले से दूसरा भी हम क्वेश्चन लेते रहेंगे जाते जाते एक बात और भी कहूँगा कि दिस इज एवर आर फर्स्ट एवर वेबिनार ऑफ ऑस्ट्रेलियन कॉन्सेप्ट और मैं समझता हूँ कि इस सिचुएशन में जब हम घर में मौजूद हैं बाहर निकलना इस वक्त काफी प्रॉब्लमेटिक है वायरस के वाले से तो दिस इज अ ग्रेट मीडियम हम मुतवातर दिनों में और मुतवातर जो टॉपिक्स हैं उनको लेकर आके आप लोगों के साथ शेयर करते रहेंगे और आपको पोस्टर भी शेयर करते रहेंगे थैंक यू सो वेरी मच आप लोगों का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू सो मच